Okay, well, we're going to get started. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will be manning the chat. And hopefully we can answer your questions as we go along. Otherwise, we can hold them till the end. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Ganaya. All right. Hi, everyone. So these are the agenda items that we'll be covering today. The materials that we are going over today, so this PowerPoint, as well as um, the agenda will be available on our help desk. So um, when you have the time to kind of look through them after this meeting, you can click the links and it will take you to each of the different sections. So to start us off, we have some new forms um, available on Wufu. Um, Wufu is the new software we are using for all of our forms. And um, so far we have added the client deletion request form and the agency administrator designation form. So if you need to um, designate anyone to be, you know, the secondary or there needs to be a change in agency administrators, that is the form that you would want to use. And last but not least, we have the reports request form. Um, and I will let Brian speak a little bit more on that. And I'll let you share here, Brian. All right. So, like Ganiel said, we are starting to use Wufu to kind of uh, put most of our forms as much as we can on. Kind of a web based format to reduce the amount of paper that goes around and kind of keep everything in a central location. And then, if you know, if you need to just fill it out on the computer, you can't, you don't have to necessarily print one out. Um, there is a new report request form. This is something that um, we have started in the past with SurveyMonkey, and we're trying to kind of get it more in use. And it really is about collecting the information we need. So this is the help desk guide where you can see we do have some of the, you know, the new uh, guides and information coming. So there is a data and reporting section. If you click on that, it will you'll see a custom report link and you can find the report request form here. Um, it gives a little information as to why we're doing it, but also if you go to the submit a request option, um, and this is where we'd seen it in the past with the survey monkey link, we have this question about is it an HMIS report request? If it is, there is the link here for the WUFU form. The reason we're doing this is this is not about an existing report. This is about a new report. So if you need a report uh, built by HMIS staff, this is what you would use. And the reason is because for us to build a report and do it efficiently, we need certain pieces of information. Um, so instead of getting a ticket and then we have to respond to it and collect that information, this just asks for it up front. It's very clear about the information that we need in order to start it. It doesn't mean there won't be a conversation. Um, more likely than not, after getting this, we may have a couple questions or a couple things. Just We just wanna get clarification on, um, but this is basically designed to collect the key pieces of information that we need to start building that report. So we're asking for any report request submission to be submitted at least five business days prior to when you would need it. Uh, we do we do ask for two days to review the request. This is you know again to allow us time to look at the request, see what's being asked, make sure what we you know we have the data available, we're able to pull it. If you're pulling something directly from your you know, your assessment or some performance outcomes, a lot of that information is obviously already in HMIS, so that's not an issue. But it gives us time to kind of plan it out and make sure that what you're asking for is possible. And it lets us ask those questions that we may need. So if you're asking for something like length of time, they, they can seem like simple measures, but sometimes there's a little more intricacy to it. So that five day window allows us time to review the request and then some time to actually build it and get clarification from you if we need it. So it asks for basic contact information, nothing, nothing too intense at this point. It's really just who do we reach out to about the request if we have any questions. 
we ask that you, know, you fill this out. If you're submitting this on someone else's behalf, you can also put their information in here. So maybe this is a conversation that came up. Someone asked for this information and you are passing this information on to us. You can put their contact information in here if they're okay with that and we can reach out to them directly as well to you know, get some clarification on what is, you know, what is the purpose and the outcome intended for this request. So I'm just gonna go through real quick and put in some of the information here. Uh, it does require you to answer certain things. So if you don't complete certain fields, then you know, the report's not gonna go through because we need to have that information. So after we get the contact information, it does ask for what the purpose of the report is. And so this isn't necessarily something that's going to indicate that we're not gonna do it. It's just, if you're using this for your own internal re review purposes, the way the report is built is probably going to be different. If you're doing this for, you know, data review, looking at the clients that are enrolled in your programs, the services that are being provided, you may want just a essentially an Excel sheet with all of the client information in there with some highlights on the you know, missing values and some data, data errors. If you are using this for, you know, some kind of, you know, presentation or other purpose where you want something different, you, know, you may be looking for counts, you may be looking for, you know, different kinds of measures presented in a different fashion. So this is really just to help us understand, you know, is this something that needs to have like a presentable output or is this something that, you know, you're keeping internally where you just need to look at the client identifying information and things like that. Then we have again, the intended use of the report. This goes back to kind of the same purpose depending on the intent for the report, you know, maybe that we do a few things a little differently in how it's assembled. So again, this is really just for our own purposes. And we also like to know when we provide reports, you know, where is this information going? Because there may be caveats like this isn't clean data yet, so don't necessarily pass it on to your funder. Um, you know, let's, let's review it first, see if there are things that can be cleaned up and rerun the report. So it just helps us understand that. And also just for our own purposes to know, you know, We've we had a lot of requests for this because it can help us planning and figuring out are there things that we can build that are just widely available for projects or for agencies to use. Once you complete that, we go into just the basic questions about the report. So again, when do you need the report? You know, put in the date. I mean, we, we're asking for five days. You can submit something if it's due sooner. It's just the sooner it's due, you know, the more difficult it is for us to complete that request depending on the amount of work we have going on. So again, we're, we're asking for at least five business days. So if you know you're gonna have something coming due, even if it's three months from now, we can, we can get it on our calendar and you have it on the radar and start working on it. It doesn't have to be done, you know, just a week before. We can, we can set stuff up in advance. So we ask that you just put in the date that you would need it. And then what is the report date range? So if you're asking for us to build a report that you will then run, this doesn't matter as much, but if you're asking for, you know, a report to help with an, a grant application or something, we need to know this date because we'll get something like fiscal year 2020. Well, the HUD fiscal year is different than the county fiscal year, it's different than some of the city fiscal years. So just put in the specific dates. So, you know, if you're looking for a year, make sure you specify what that year would be. Um, you know, a quarter, whatever it is, if, if it's not something that's, if it's something that you're going to run on your own, then just put something in here. So we have a kind of a way to test it and start with the report. Um, but it is a required area. So you will have to fill something out, even if it's something that you're going to run monthly or quarterly on your, your own. And then finally, just a text field where we ask for what you want in the report. So this is where you say, you know, we need client demographics, we need length of stay, we need exits to permanent housing. As detailed as you can be in this is great because this helps us know what data elements to include, if we need to do any calculations in the report, if we need to you know, build something additional to just some client information, if you're looking at returns to homelessness or exits to permanent housing, you know, if let's say you're looking for exits to permanent housing, tell us we need counts, we need percentages, you know, we need it broken out by 
household type, by veteran status, whatever it is, as detailed as you can be is great. Again, we'll, there's a good chance that we'll reach out to you just with a couple of clarifying remarks just to make sure we are doing the right thing. But otherwise, we're really just trying to collect the minimal, minimal information that we need to start building the report. Um, and this also helps us know whether also the report is even possible. So once you're done, you'll click submit, you'll get this notification. You'll get an email uh, that tells you the information that you submitted. Again, we're asking for two days to review it just so we can, again, make sure that we have the information we need. It's possible, you know, and in that time, we'll follow up with you to let you know, you know, the status of it. You know, this is something we can do. We, you know, this is something that we're not able to do right now with the data we have, um, you know, whether we can, we can have some flexibility on the, the due date, you know, depending on, you know, schedules and, and what's going on at that time. So this is just designed to simplify that process and help us track those requests, make sure we have the information. Filling this out in most instances means that we'll have all of the information we need to build the report. Like so we may have a few follow-up questions, you know, a few clarifying questions, but just getting this information should give us basically everything that we need to actually start building that report for you. So just fill it out to the best of your knowledge. If you have any questions when you're trying to complete it, you can send us a ticket. We can help with that. Um, and if you if you aren't quite sure what you need in it, when it comes time to ask for when it, you know when you're filling out what information you need in the report, you can you know you can even say you know you can put in some information that you need. And if you keep it general, if you put, you can even put in there and you know, can you please contact us about the report and we can reach out to you and, and ask those questions. So it's designed to help you. It's designed to help us and ideally will make the process a lot more efficient. So uh, that form is available now. We do ask that if you have any custom report requests that you do uh, go through the help desk and use it and it should make everyone's life a little easier when it comes to building some of those custom requests. Hey, thank you, Brian. So, so I'll pass it back over to you, Danielle, and you can move on. Okay. So the next form that we want to cover is the user permission request form. So trainings, um, the way to request trainings has shifted a little bit. We're still filling out the end user agreement forms. Your users are still doing the DCF courses, uh, but now the user permission request form is now on Wufu. The link is available in the PowerPoint so uh, that you are able to kind of click on that and go to that link. And after completing the form, you will be automatically redirected to Calendly, which is the training scheduler. And you'll be able to pick the date that that user needs to be trained on. So um, you can select a day and then add guests so that you're training, let's say you're sending in a request for three people that needs to be trained under shelter point. You can um, add that, add all the users on one date. And if I can share a little bit about the form here. All right, this is what the form looks like. Um, at the very top, we have just today's date. You'll be specifying whether this request is for a new user, whether it needs to, uh, whether you need to change a user's information or if you need to remove a user. And over here on the right side, you'll want to pick yes or no on whether the user will need to run reports or not. And we have this top section where we go over some of the agency information. So the name, uh, the, the user's manager name, and as well as the program manager contact information. And the next section is that user information. So their first and last name, their title, their email address, phone number, uh, what their primary provider needs to be. And over here on this bottom section, this is where you'll list all of the additional programs that that user will need access to. We have the level two background screen clearance date that needs to go in this field. And remember, we only want the date for the background clearance. We do not want the results. And over here at the very bottom, we have the attachments. So you'll just be um, selecting which of these documents you're submitting 
and you'll select whether they're all under one PDF. And so you'll be able to just add all the files in at once, or if they're not, you can break it up to where you have uh, the end user agreement on one section and the city certificate separate. Then we have the agency administrator name and email address that goes down here. So the email, this email field right here, this email will get a, a confirmation when this request is submitted. So I will head back on over to the slideshow. And our next topic is talent. So our learning management software, and we are very, very excited to be launching talent. So let's talk a little bit about the transition to talent. So um, end users who are due for a refresher training in the near future will receive a registration email. And for this to go smoothly, we really want to make sure that all of the end users have an up to date profile in HMIS and to pay particularly close attention to that email field because this is where the talent registration link will go to. Um, the password reset links, whenever a user clicks that forgot password on the login screen, that is the email that the link will be sent to. So please be sure that the users have. Um, an up to date and current email on their profile. Uh, missing or expired email may result in a delay in receiving the refresher training link. And so that user may remain expired until the refresher is completed. We move on to the next section here. This is where you want to update the email information. So over here on the top right of the service point screen, there's going to be a little cogwheel next to the user's name that they can click on. And this is where you'll see that email and phone number fields. So what is available on talent currently? So we have about four um, courses right now. So we have the privacy and security, which is the prerequisite for the HMIS data entry course. Um, the HMIS data entry course is separated into two separate categories. So for client, um, for users who are needing to use client point and users who need to be trained under shelter point. And following the HMIS data entry course is a HUD elements explained course where it goes through um, all of those data elements. The HMIS data entry courses will be used for new user trainings and annual refreshers. So upon completion, the user will receive a certificate and that certificate will always be available on the user's profile screen. So they're always able to go back and look at all of their certificates. And the course will be reassigned to the user about two weeks before their next expiration. So some of the topics that are covered in that course are style guide, searching for clients, if you can't find them, how to add them to the system, um, creating a household, modifying a household, adding an entry services, and the course covers a lot more. So if we head on to the next slide here. This is the data elements explain course. And this course covers all universal data elements. It covers the project specific data elements. Um, this course specifically highlights um, why this field is important, how we use it, data entry tips, some instructions, um, it has some follow up questions that can be used when trying to determine uh, a good answer for that field. And last but not least, who this field is required for. And at this point, I will hand it over to Brian. All right. So we're getting close to that time of year where we have the new HUD data standards that are going to be released. Uh, so we have some preliminary information so you can be aware of the changes that are coming. Um, like always, the release date is October 1st. So October 1st, 2021, we will have the new HUD data standards live in Pinellas HMIS. The standards are available now, but we are still getting, we're still waiting on the project manuals for like ESG, SSVF, PATH, uh, the COC funded projects. So that information should come out sometime in August. So we are still waiting for 
some of that information, but we do have some some changes that are going to impact all of our providers. And so Ganiel just mentioned you know, talent. So we're going to look at talent as a way to get a lot of this information out because it is something that all end users will need to understand and be aware of. Not all of the changes apply to everyone. There are some that are only for specific funding streams, but there are some general changes that will impact all providers as well. The, the big changes this year really are around some of the language that are being used in some of the demographic questions, the disability categories, and these were done by HUD working with local COCs across the country. There are additional changes to some of these that are going to be coming in the future, but they're not live yet. So expect to see some additional changes, um, especially as HUD puts a lot of emphasis on race equity uh, across the country. So. We are seeing some of those changes this year. We may see some more next year. HUD has generally moved to a two year calendar where every two years we see large standard changes, and then the off years we see maybe minor updates. This is one of kind of the larger years, so we should see a few more changes this year than we would, let's say, in you know, 2022 um, or what we saw last year. So there are some changes coming. As far as data elements goes, and then the other big kind of more exciting part is that HUD is also recognizing that they have a pretty big role to play when it comes to data quality. And so the one other change that is in a lot of these updates is that HUD is actually making some determinations on things that HMIS systems, the HMIS software should not allow end users to do. And so we are seeing some of those come out. We don't know fully what that will look like yet. Well, Sky is still building that into the system. We will see you know, what this looks like in early September. Uh, so we have time to build training materials and things like that for the go live date of October 1st. But the data quality changes are nice because it also means that HUD realizes that they have created a lot of data elements that sometimes are tricky for end users to understand what HUD wanted because when they when they interpret it, they may interpret it differently. And so some of these will really help with making sure that end users are doing what HUD expects for some of them and kind of helps prevent them from you know, making some of those mistakes. So if you want to go to the next slide, you can so uh, you can go on to the next one. So we are we do see some of the universal data element updates. And again, these are these are the updates that are going to impact everybody. So the first one is race. Uh, so in in HMIS right now, there is a a primary and a secondary race option. Um, HUD is realizing that having that kind of idea is is problematic when it comes to end users because HUD has an expectation of how those are completed, but it doesn't really make sense. And we see a lot of end users sometimes skip the secondary race. So there are some changes to how this is being collected and changes in how it's going to be implemented in service point in, in HMIS. So the first thing is language. HUD is, is expanding some of the categories and working on tweaking the language that is used on race. So instead of saying uh, American Indian or Alaska Native, it's American Indian, Alaska Native or Indigenous. Asian is now Asian or Asian American, Black or African American is now Black, African American or African, and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander is now Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. These are relatively small changes this year as far as language goes. HUD is looking to start even drilling down even further into some of these categories. We just don't see that information yet. So expect some more changes with race in the future. We're just not sure when or exactly the form they will take. HUD is still working on really finalizing what they want to see from this. The other big change is that instead of doing the primary secondary race dropdown, it's actually going to be a series of checkboxes. So an end user will get, be given these options and along with the you know client doesn't know, client refused, data not collected options. Um, and you know the white category, the ones that are not listed here, the, all the categories will be there, just some wording changes, and they'll be able to pick and, the, and just check the box next to which one the client identifies as. Where this is really going to help is right now HUD's expectation is, is you have someone that just identifies as one race, that the end user also picks that for the secondary race. That 
it, I mean, when you read the standards, it's, it's clear when the end user is filling it out, it, that doesn't really make sense to them. So we see that missed a fair amount and left blank, and that can create some errors. This is just, if they only identify as one race, you just check that box, you leave the rest blank. It's a, it's a nice, simple update. It is a different form of data entry, so end users will have to get used to that, and we'll have to make sure they understand that it's still allowing them to select multiple races. It's just not done in separate dropdowns. I'm going to the next slide. Ethnicity is going to be a pretty simple update. Again, it's language changes. So instead of saying non-Latino or Latino, it's going to be the non non latina latino latin x option so it's going to have the more inclusive uh suffix on the wording so this one is still going to be a drop down uh, as far as we know at this point it's still just going to be those two options and then the client refuse doesn't know options but they are just changing the language slightly on this gender is going to follow the same basic layout as race does so we have a lot of the same options, but a good example is the transgender categories in HMS right now. There's transgender female to male and transgender male to female. And what HUD is looking at is instead of having kind of that broken out like that, it's going to allow for multiple selections on this, just like with race. So someone can identify as just transgender if they so choose. If they want to identify as transgender and male or transgender and female, they can also do that. If they want to identify as uh, transgender and questioning or um, the gender other than singularly female or male, they have options for this. This is one that will have to take some training so end users get used to kind of what the expectation is here. And again, it allows for multiple options to be selected. So it's going to be another series of checkboxes, which is going to be a new type of uh, response option in HMIS for assessments. And so again, we'll have to look at, you know, what that looks like once we see WellSky's implementation and get some training materials out on that as well. So now we're going to get into some of these data quality logic fixes that HUD is asking vendors to do. The first one is going to be relationship to head of household. This is one that as someone that looks at some of this data and has to help correct some of this for some of the federal reports, this one's actually really exciting to me. So head of household is really important for a lot of the reports that we submit to HUD. Head of household determines a lot of things like, you know, what is, where do we find some of this information, some of the data elements like housing move-in dates, um, some of the other questions about that household status are supposed to be collected under that head of household. So who that person is in that group of records is actually really important. And so when you see a household that has nobody identified as such or two people identified as such, it, it makes for a lot of problems with reporting. And so that's the one way that this is going to improve. The other one is that, and this is a, uh, mistake that we do see is if it's an individual, they are they are automatically self head of household. We see somewhere, you know, a household member has split off, they're receiving services by themselves, you know, they've gone to a, a shelter by themselves. They still need to be marked as self head of household, even if it's a, a, you know, a child or a young adult that's split from their family, it still needs to be self head of household. And I think there's some confusion sometimes in how this is completed. So what this is going to do and again, we don't know exactly the form, it, the form it's going to take once WellSky has this implemented, but there's going to be logic designed to prevent multiple heads of household from being selected for a household or making sure that you know, an individual is marked as self-head of household. Again, I don't know what form that's going to take. This is just what HUD is asking all the vendors to start implementing. And so there may be some differences between some of the different uh, HMIS vendors. And I am very excited to see what WellSky does with this. I think it's, again, the start of this, this idea that HUD can really do a lot to help us with data quality by having vendors implement certain rules that prevent, you know, data that doesn't make sense from being entered. So this is a kind of a great start to that. And hopefully this will also help with data quality. You know, if you have a household that comes in, maybe 
the end user doesn't realize that this other person is marked as head of household. They're updating the, the person that presented. They're putting that information in. Hopefully this will help catch some of those to prevent some of those issues from continuing on and make reporting easier and understanding that household situation a lot easier. Go to the next slide. The next one is housing move in date, and this is another one where we're going to see this logic come in. So any relevant project enrollment, whether it's rapid housing or permanent supportive housing, is supposed to have a housing move in date when they move into permanent housing. So for permanent supportive housing, for the most part across our COC, this would be the same date as their entry date. Um, and then for rapid housing, of course, this is when they actually take occupancy of that that unit or home, whatever it, whatever type of housing it is. So there should only be one housing move-in date between the entry and the exit for a client. The, there's also a situation where the housing move-in date shouldn't be removed. We see it occasionally where they're housed somewhere and they go to another program and they they see this old housing move-in date and they remove it because the person's no longer housed. It, again, it makes sense to the end user, but it does impact reporting because depending on how it's removed, it could it could make it seem like that person was never housed in that that project. So it is a data quality issue and it's not something that's done you know, intentionally. It's just the end user sees it as this is when they were housed, but they're not housed anymore. So I should clear it out. So some of it will be preventing that from happening. It doesn't mean you can never remove one. It's just preventing it from being done like that. And then the other thing is that it's going to help reinforce how some of this data should be captured. So if someone is housed in rapid rehousing and they lose that housing, but they're still eligible for services, they're actually supposed to be discharged from rapid rehousing, then re-enrolled. And what that does is it says that during this period of time, they were housed. So you still get credit for that housing. And then when they have lost that housing, you have this new enrollment that shows, okay, now at this point, this household is no longer housed. So it helps track that history and know kind of what's going on with those clients. So this should help with that and make sure that you know data is consistent and clean and we can you know, know the situation for the different clients. So this is again one where we don't know what form it's going to take for implementation. We just know that some of this data quality logic is coming. Go to the next slide. So now we're going to get into the project specific data elements. These are things like the HUD verifications. And if you have a funding stream like SSVF or ESG or uh, runaway homeless youth, you may have additional questions that are mandated by your funder. But some of these are again, things that are answered by most, if not all of our providers for at least some of their projects. So disabling conditions is one where HUD again is looking to update the language, take away from, take away some of the kind of stigmatizing language or the problematic language they used on some of these and try to make it, you know, again, less stigmatizing. So mental health, it used to be mental health problem. HUD has updated that to mental health disorder. Uh, then we had substance abuse problem in the last standards. It's being updated to substance use disorder and then alcohol and drug abuse are being updated to alcohol use and drug use. And so this is something that's being done in that disability verification, but if you see if you see this wording elsewhere in your own assessment, some of those funding streams do collect similar questions. All of that language is going to be updated to match this new uh, the new language around these uh, disabling conditions. So if you have this elsewhere, you'll see that update in all of the verifications, you'll also see this information update. <clears throat> you can go on to the next slide. So the, we're going to get into some of the uh, funding specific data elements and I won't spend as much time on some of these because we will provide this information to those, those projects and make sure, you know, those end users do get the training necessary. We want to make sure we cover you know, this information so everyone kind of knows what's coming. You know, funding can change in the future and some of these elements are available and going to be required for certain projects, but we have indications from HUD that the use may be expanded. So the first one is a well-being uh, data element. This is a brand new data element. This is really the, the first time we're seeing HUD use subjective information. 
Um, obviously, there are some things that can be subjective, but there's usually an objective quality to most of what HUD is doing. This is the first time it's really a how do you perceive something uh, data element. Currently, it's going to be required for all COC funded permanent supportive housing projects. But HUD has already indicated that they are interested in applying this to COC funded rapid rehousing projects too. So if you're a PSH pro provider that receives COC funding or you receive rapid rehousing funding from the COC, I would definitely recommend paying attention because this could come for rapid rehousing next year uh, if they see you know, success with it this year. So this is something that would be collected on that head of household. So again, we go back to why identifying head of household is so important. It doesn't have to be collected on the rest of the family. So if you have multiple adults, it's still just on that one, that one client. And moving forward from October 1st, it would be collected at, at their project start, updated on annual assessments, and then a project exit. If you have people that are already enrolled, you do not have to go back and collect this information for their start or an annual assessment done before October 1st. And you'll see why when we get to the questions on the next slide. But this is just something that is just going to start October 1st and move forward. And on that note, too, I'll just mention with the, the race, the other demographic questions, all of that is going to be mapped over by WellSky when the change occurs. So all of those changes to the language and how that information is collected is going to be handled by our vendor. You don't have to worry about updating that for clients that are you know, enrolled in your projects on October 1st. That will be taken care of. And then for the rest of these data elements, they're generally all being applied from October 1st moving forward. So. You don't have to worry about back entry or updating anything already. Just get ready for this information to come on October 1st. And go to the next slide. So the well-being questions, these are again they're subjective. So they all use the Likert scale, and they basically go from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And so we have questions like client perceives their life has value and worth. Client perceives they have support from others who will listen to their problems. Client perceives they have a tendency to bounce back after hard times. Client's frequency of feeling nervous, tense, worried, frustrated, or afraid. So you have these questions where the client is going to kind of give information about how they're feeling, you know, how they're feeling now that they're in this, pro this, this project, this permanent supportive housing. And some of what HUD is looking for is to see, you know, not just who is being served, but how are they, how is their well-being improving while they are in these projects? And so right now, if you had someone new come in, you'd collect that at their initial intake and get, get like that baseline of information. And then it's not going to be looking at, you know, how, you know, how these clients feel in comparison. It's designed to really show at their point of intake, you know, they they didn't, they, maybe they strongly disagreed that their life had value and worth. And then at that first annual assessment, now they, they somewhat agree. And then as you know, time goes on, they're strongly agree. And so it'll help to show some of that, that more you know, subjective information that's probably captured already in, in case notes by the case managers. But this is a way to try and, and kind of quantify some of that information. It will be in data reported to HUD. It's not, as far as we are aware right now, and HUD is voice that it's not going to be a, a metric that they are using for funding purposes or anything like that. They just kind of want to get this information. Again, a lot of this is already captured by case managers, but HUD doesn't get any of that information. So this is a way for them to try and start capturing this so they can show not just that you know these projects are housing people and keeping them housed, but they're also improving the quality of life. And I would imagine this would probably be information that does get reported to Congress in the AHAR report. So, you know, show not again, not just the housing outcomes, but the quality of life outcomes. Again, we do expect that this will be extended to rapid rehousing in the future. We just don't know when. So if you do have COC funded rapid rehousing, this may be coming next year, but right now it's just going to be for permanent supported housing. Go to the next slide. The next one is moving on assistance. This is also for COC funded permanent supportive housing. So if you have, if you do provide moving on assistance with your PSH project, 
this is something you would use. If you do not provide moving on assistance, it's not going to come up. So basically, this is something that again would be collected on that head of household whenever that assistance is provided. So if you never provide that assistance to a household or a family, you never have to complete this. If you do, you would just do an update and fill out this information with the type of moving on assistance provided. So this is this is something connected to or it can be connected to PSH projects. We won't likely see this extended to you know rapid rehousing because they don't necessarily use the moving on assistance in the same way. But this is something that is new. So if you do provide moving on assistance, this will be available October 1st. You won't have to collect it moving backwards just from that, that date forward. Go on to the next one. <clears throat> Again, we are going to uh, talk about CFC funded permanent supportive housing. They are going to start using the general health status question that uh, the runaway homeless youth providers already use. Um, it's basically going to be collected on any of the adults in the household, not just the head of household. That's just a simple question asking what their general health status is at entry and then at exit. Um, it's not, again, this one is also somewhat subjective. There can be a little more to it. You know, if you know that someone has some medical challenges and obviously that can factor into their status. Um, but this is still kind of how the the client perceives that health status. Go on to the next slide. So now we're getting into some of the other uh, basic logic updates, data quality updates that apply to some of the very specific funding uh, funding streams. So for runaway homeless youth, there's just a guidance update where they have a pregnancy status question that can be collected on any client. The guidance previously stated. Uh, female head of household or female household members only. HUD realizes with their gender changes and how that's been collected and how you know gender is identified that people that are that don't necessarily identify as female could be pregnant. So the guidance is updated for that, and this will impact the RIE repository and the data quality reports for RIE, but it, it doesn't impact the data collection. There is nothing that prevented RIE providers from collecting this information on a client that did not identify as female previously. So it, it's not really going to have an impact on data entry as much as it is on the reporting side of it. Go on to the next slide. SSBF gets a couple updates as well. The first one is changes to the financial assistance drop down for their services. The first one is that General Housing Stability Assistance Emergency Supplies is getting merged into the General Housing Stability Assistance Other Option. The just straight other option is being removed and then a food assistance option is being added to their pick list for financial assistance. And then the uh, Homeless Prevention <clears throat> Targeting Criteria for SSDF is getting completely overhauled. Um, and I won't go through this in detail because it is it is quite a lengthy sub-assessment. It is SSVF only, so we'll make sure our SSVF provider has good information on this. Um, but basically, it allows them to screen for the prevention assistance. There's a yes, no question. If they are not required to use the screening for that client, they can skip the rest of it. Otherwise, they would go and fill out the questions. Go to the next slide. Again, this is a very lengthy sub-assessment that collects information. A lot of it's information that would probably be captured in case notes as well, but information about like when they expect to lose their current housing, their income level, any history of homelessness, information about being a leaseholder. Go on to the next slide. Um, if they're at risk of losing a subsidy, if they've had any past evictions, so it goes through a pretty detailed history of the client's record to determine their uh, prevention targeting score. Go to the next slide. It ends up with giving a uh, applicant total for this information and helps guide the uh, prevention assistance for, through SSVF. So this is one where you know, we do see instances where data elements from one funding stream get adopted by others. This one fits pretty specifically in with what SSDF is asking for. I don't expect to see this one get extended any further, but you know, you never know. There, 
there could be a chance that HUD sees this and they want to adopt it for ESG funding or someone else wants to adopt it for their own prevention funding. But right now this is uh, SSVF funding only. Go on to the next slide. So those are all of our changes. They are, I mean, there are a few other small changes happening on the back end that you don't have to really worry yourself about there. They, you know, some new funding sources are coming online that we have to be able to set up in case someone gets them. But as far as the data entry portion goes, that's really it for the changes. We're still waiting on the manuals and to actually see what <clears throat> these things look like in HMIS. But even though they're simple changes, there is actually some pretty big impacts from this. So the, the first one is that, again, we're going to have checkboxes as a, a, an option for end users to complete when filling out client records and assessments. So instead of just using drop downs and the HUD verifications and typing in you know, to a text box, we're going to have the checkboxes. And so end users will have to adjust to that. And again, those questions, although they're simple changes, instead of being guided by primary, secondary race, you're going to get you know a single option with multiple check boxes a client can respond to one two three four options however many they identify with so there will be some changes to how that information is collected the biggest impact is that because demographics are getting changed basically every report in hmis whether it is hud mandated vendor published like the client served report or it's a local custom report that has been built most of them, if not all of them, are going to have to change. You know, the, we used to have primary, secondary race. You would pull that information, you know, combine them to figure out if it was white, black, multiracial. You know, client doesn't know. Now we're going to have check boxes. We don't know what that will look like as far as reporting goes. HUD has obviously ideas for their own reports. WellSky is working on getting reports updated to go live for October 1st. But again, all of these reports, the APR, the CAPER, the client served report, uh, the PATH report, completeness, data quality, all of these reports will have to be rebuilt because demographics are such a big part of a lot of this information. And so just keep that in mind that we will see those changes you know, coming up on October 1st. There could be, depending on how, you know, the SAGE repository or you know, the SSVF repository handles some of that information. There may be delays when a report with the new standards is available. We don't know yet whether, again, all of that information will get mapped over, but we don't know if the SAGE repository will be expecting the demographics from the current standards or if it will just be on October 1st. If you submit a report after that, it's submitting with the new one. So, as we get that information from WellSky, as we know what the status is for those reports and when those changes are coming, we'll let you know. But there is a chance some of them may have a slight delay after October 1st, just given the sheer amount of work that has to go into a lot of this. Um, so again, they're, they're smaller changes as far as language goes, but they have a pretty significant reporting impact on the back end that will affect virtually all of the reports in HMIS. <clears throat> so we're gonna we're gonna step away from the standard changes for a little bit and you know we're, we're done with those. We don't have to revisit those until you know our next agency admin meeting where we'll hopefully have examples of what that looks like. So we're gonna dip into some data quality. Um, so HMIS staff and Avery and really a number of other people from HLA, we do a monthly data review where we look at all sorts of data. And from that, we do find, you know, we'll reach out to a provider with some tips, some help. We see some things that maybe need to be fixed. So we'll do some of that, but we also, you know, look for things where we see these trends across the system. And the one thing that came up at our last data review is the issue of the other exit destination option. And this one is always kind of an interesting one because we see it used for a lot of different reasons and it's not it's not used a lot but it's used enough where you can actually see a, you know an impact from it in our system level reports in APRs capers other data quality and in the mo in, in most times when we've looked at the record itself it's actually 
there, there's a better option that actually works. So it's really never recommended that the other, de other exit destination is selected. The reason it's in there is occasionally a weird situation comes up that HUD did not expect. They don't have a category for it. And HUD actually asks if we see that, you know, let them know. They collect information. They try to see what needs to be changed for the standards to match local needs. You know, if there's a weird situation that comes up, we can get verification from HUD as to what that destination should actually be. And it may be something that they need to actually update. You know, they want to add it to their standards and, and put something specific in there. But generally, I mean, I've, I have never seen a situation where I was like, yes, the other destination is the one that should have been picked. When you do the exit destination, it's really what is the best option? It doesn't mean it's the perfect option. And you know, so we have like rental by client with ongoing subsidy or rental by client with no subsidy. What, what they are renting doesn't necessarily matter. It's not this is specifically an apartment or specifically a house. I mean, if they're renting, you know, a room and doing home share, it, it still works. You know, as long as they have a lease that they have signed that stipulates their, you know, their rights and responsibilities as a tenant, like it's still a rental. So when you select other, it doesn't really do anything for you. It doesn't count it as a as a permanent exit destination or a temporary or institutional. It really just doesn't count. It's it's well, HUD has moved away from positive and negative exits. HUD realizes that those terms don't work. They carry a lot of weight. This is still one of those indeterminate ones because when it when it's other, we don't know what that is. We can't classify it. We can't categorize it. And so it doesn't really do anything for a project's outcomes or your know, data usability. Really, all it does is impact data quality and potentially hurt outcomes. So as much as we can, we definitely recommend not using other unless you have this really odd situation. So go to the next slide. So in our recent data review, I pulled out some of the cases and just mark them. If you, I mean, they're, they're, they're generally pretty broad. If you recognize them, we're not picking on anyone. We see this system wide again. We're not talking about huge numbers, but when we only have, you know, like when we look at our system performance measures and we have a thousand exits or 2000 exits to permanent housing at the end of the year, you know, and we have 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 others, it's not a huge impact, but it, it can be an impact. And so I pulled out a few of those examples and we see, you know, different reasons for it. And so, so the one the one that we saw, so client A, we have a there, you know, so we have the other destination. There's a note put in there. And actually that's great. You know, if you don't know, you can reach out to the help desk and be like, I have this client, I put a note in there to say we can help you figure out what that should be. So the first one was there's a note that just said that the client self-resolved. So they're no longer homeless and they're they're exited. Now the client doesn't have any activity after that. So we don't know necessarily where, where they went, but the person who filled it out said, you know, they self-resolved. So I would assume that they have you know, some information about where they ended up going. And if they do, this is a permanent exit. Right now it's not, it's not doing that. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that can even be classified, but this is a permanent exit that was, that was missed out on. And so, you know, this would be that kind of desired outcome from that project, but because it was selected as other, we can't really do anything with it. The next one was, again, we don't have a note, but we had the reason for leaving and the reason for leaving is placement. Now, placement from different providers, you know, different projects is, is, is different. You know, emergency shelter may have placement that's different from, you know, street outreach or different from, you know, a homeless case management provider. But placement generally appears to be something where like, this is the outcome we are looking you know, we got them placed into a situation, whether it's permanent housing, whether it's, you know, a substance use treatment program, whether it is, you know, a hospital for medical care. This is, this is the kind of outcome that it looks like a, a provider would want. Marking it as other means it's not something we can report on. You know, we can, we can pull that other, but it doesn't, it doesn't distinguish from, 
you know, no exit interview or anything. It's it's really just not usable. So again, this is one that looks like it should be a, a good outcome for that project. Then the, the client C example is reason for leaving was again marked as completed program. This is kind of the same thing. I mean, where they go after that, you know, completing that program may not get them to a specific location. They may be in the same the same spot. They could be in a rental unit. They could be staying with a family or friend. You know, but completed program generally again seems to indicate that this is a desired outcome. But because the destination was marked as other, we really can't do anything with that. <clears throat> so again, all three of these, and these are not the only ones. There are more, and this is what we see a lot of. They all seem to be the outcomes that a provider would want, but that destination prevents us from counting it like that. Do you want to go to the next slide? So here are some examples of you know what to pick if if you have if you're if you're tempted to pick the other destination. So the first one, you know, I, I saw several where the client disappeared on them, they picked other. There's a no exit interview completed option. Now I know, so this goes back to getting away from positive and negative outcomes, because it used to be no exit interview is a negative outcome. Obviously, no exit interview means we don't know, but we can use this information. It helps us know what happened. Other is just this giant question mark. We don't know what that is. We know people disappear from projects. We, we see that, we see the data all the time. It's not a local thing, it's a national thing. So picking no exit interview is not an issue that it's not going to change what your outcomes look like either way it's still going to be basically the same result but it helps us know this is what happened in that in that case another one is a situation where a client was transferred from i mean this one is from a permanent board of housing provided to another one but it could be from project to project and so the reason was you know transfer or placement, but then the exit destination was other, even though we have that information as to where they went. And whatever that per pick pick the destination that fits the best for that transfer. If they're going to a permanent supportive housing project, pick the permanent housing for formerly homeless persons option. If they're, you know, if they're going from a shelter to staying with family or friends, pick that option. You know, if they're if they're shifting, make sure you mark it with what that is. A transfer obviously is a little different than placement, but that's why we captured the reason for leaving. The exit destination should still be where are they going to be, you know, staying the next night or that night? Like, what is that location? Um, you know, if, if again, if they're marked as completing the program or placement, where do they go? You know, just pick that, pick the one that fits the best. There are you know, dozens of options for destination. They fit most categories. You know, if you see something come up, that seems odd, reach out to us. But the other option is use the data in HMIS. You know, if you, and, and this is one, if a client disappears from your program and you're going to close them out and you are you see that they are staying in a shelter somewhere, they're staying in transitional housing program, you can pick that destination. Even though they didn't tell you that, you can use the information in HMIS. So if you were gonna pick other because they disappeared or, you know, they, they, they told you they were going somewhere else, but you're not sure exactly what type that is. You can use the data in HMIS to help guide you on that destination. Go to the next slide. And again, the, the big thing I'll come back to is if you are, if someone is going to pick other, just reach out to the help desk with kind of the basic information that's going on and we'll help you find, you know, a good case. You know, with some of them, we can see where that person ended up, where they went. But then there are some where, like, that's the last contact we see in HMIS. And what we don't, what we want to avoid is, you know, we don't identify that this is an other exit for six months. And then when we go to look, you know, we don't have the information to help out with that. So the earlier we can get through on this, the, you know, the better we can update this information and make sure we have, you know, nice usable information that, helps when you look at our system, helps individual projects, it helps identify funding needs, you know, and helps make sure that we, we kind of have a great idea of what's going on with the individual clients. I think I'll turn it over to Cindy then after this. So we're 
really excited to let you all know that we're going to be starting to distribute a newsletter in regards to HMIS, and it'll be distributed on the fourth Friday of every month. So keep an eye on your spam folder because it's going through constant contact. So it may it may go into your spam. So just keep a Keep an eye out for that. Um, we'll have little tips and things that you should know, or maybe cheats, you know, like, did you know that you could do this to make your time more efficient? Um, we'll also be recognizing new participating agencies as they come on board. We'll have, um, we'll have like a highlight of certain agencies. We'll have a highlight of a specific uh, training course located in talent. So we're really excited about this and just um, keep your eyes open for the fourth Friday of each month and you should be getting it in the near future. We're really excited about it. Hi everybody, it's Avery, your favorite quality person. So, I have something very short for you all today. Yesterday, we had a training with our rapid rehousing providers. Rapid rehousing now conducts the full SPDAT assessment. This has been going on since November. It was at the request of our case managers that we begin incorporating this assessment into rapid rehousing. So it's pretty unique how that policy was developed. It wasn't something that the Continuum of Care Board said they wanted as a policy or the Homeless Leadership Alliance staff said needed to be policy. This came straight from case managers. With that, we found through Brian that there is a way to capture the SPDAT in HMIS. And I know there's a lot of moaning and groaning of, oh no, another assessment. Trust me when I tell you, the rapid rehousing case managers did not moan or groan once they saw the training. Ganayel can back me up on this one. So I wanted you all to know that effective July 1, we are going to start requiring that the SPDAT assessments be entered into Pinellas HMIS. These have to be entered based on when the policy states the assessment needs to be completed. Right now, the policy states that the SPDAT is to be completed 30 days after a person is housed, 60 days after they're housed, 120 days after they're housed, and so on. Next slide. So, when people enter into HMIS for SPDAT, it is very, very, very simple. They are literally just entering in the totals for each of the domains. They saw yesterday, there's two different ways that they can do it. It's very fast, it's very easy. It does not take long at all. And this is what it's gonna look like when they're finished. So why on earth would we want to do this? Well, for one thing, we're gonna be able to collect the data and begin looking at what happens when a client comes into the system. We already know how we measure for vulnerabilities to get into the system, but what's going on with them while they're there? So this gives a really great review also for the case manager to build that housing plan. Next slide. This is what the case manager is gonna see in a summary. This is the very first assessment that was entered in. And as a case manager, I know, okay, wow, I have got to really strengthen my housing plan to ensure that I am supporting the client's mental health, wellness, and cognitive functioning, their involvement in high risk or exploitative situations, interaction with emergency services, self care, and just their history of homelessness. Making sure being housed, that's already gonna bring that down. So this is what I really need to focus on 
within these first 30 days after I got this person housed. So then at my 60 day, next slide, that's gonna be my summary. After working with this client for 60 days, I've done the assessment again, and here I can see now after 60 days, okay, while well, mental health and wellness is pretty, it's become stabilized, but this client has a lot of trauma and abuse. It's something that they didn't feel comfortable sharing until after the relationship had been built. So I need to start focusing there. The same thing with the personal administration and money management. That needs to be a focus. Now that they're in their own home, I need to ensure that they can be stably housed. So I have to focus there. So as you can see, it's a benefit for the continuum of care as well as the case manager, which is why we're implementing it. It is also a very, very simple data entry process. We did find out yesterday, thanks to Brian, that we can do some um, catching of the screen. We do some copying and pasting and it will go into Excel, but Brian's also gonna see about through WellSky if we can get this into a report for case managers that use other systems and may wanna enter that data straight in there. Again, the case managers all were trained yesterday for rapid rehousing. We're giving you all the heads up about this because it will be something that will be monitored by the from myself and other funders. So you just need to be aware that this needs to be started as of July 1. And that's it. I did want to jump in and just provide an update. So um, I am working on a report from, uh, it's an art right now that will be available by July 1st that will allow you to pull this information by provider. So you'll have all of this information in, in the indiv individual client records, but obviously for some of our larger providers that have a lot of people in rapid rehousing, it'll be an easier way to get it in bulk. Um, I have some kind of dummy data in HMIS to use for that. Right now, obviously, we don't have any SPDAT data to use with it. So building the report blind is difficult. So I'm working on that. And like I said, it should be available by July 1st. Once it is, we'll make sure that rapid rehousing providers are aware of it and know how to use it, how to run the report to get the data out of HMIS. Thank you, Brian. That's why you, the HMIS team is so awesome. Thank you, Avery. Um, thank you for that compliment. We appreciate it. So that's pretty much our our meeting for today. And I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but we'll open the floor for anybody who has any questions and hopefully we can answer them. If anyone wants to, uh, we can open up and unmute you. So Victoria Weaver would like to know who will receive the newsletter. So the HMIS newsletter will actually go to all of the end users, including the agency administrators. So you all and the end users will get that. Great question. Thank you. That's why it's also important that all of your end users go into that cog wheel and make sure that their email address is correct as well, because that's where we're gathering that information from. So um, keep an eye on, you know, if they change their email address, they'll need to check their spam folder in case they don't receive it, or they can reach out to HMIS and we can definitely help them with that. But uh, so it will be all end users, as long as we have their email address. Hi, this is Carlos Bondoc with Metroman. I have a question for Brian, and this is in regards to the uh, SPDAT. The, and uh, are we going to be using that through the measurements tab? From what I understand, uh, in other uh, service point HMIS, that's where the uh, uh, FSPDAT is. Yeah, so the um... The, the SPDAT and the FSPDAT are under a measurements tab um, in HMIS. It's an area that the self-sufficiency matrix is also found there. It's an area that isn't commonly used by a lot of providers. 
um, as we are rolling out the full SPDAT and the FSPDAT, obviously it's it's going to start seeing some more use. Um, but that's where that's where the the uh, assessments are located, so it's not necessarily connected to the normal intake or client profile. Thank you. Oh, I have just another question with uh, Ganayal and all that, because she mentioned about the uh, client deletion form and all that. So, um, are we saying that we will be deleting clients instead of actually merging them? Hi, Carlos. No, th that form is more for when a client has pretty much revoked um, their consent to have their information in HMIS. So you can submit that form, um, and then it will ask some um, some information about you know if they have children that they also wanted to remove as well, um, and they can provide that information on that form, and then we would go in and adhere to their wishes. Okay, well, which is pretty much like a uh, visibility and all that. We can you can make that invisible. If that's mm -hmm. that, is that the same thing? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Great question. So Brian Marshy has a question about reports. Can you give her can you give everyone an example of the reports that agencies request and how many requests you typically get for reports? So it, it can vary a lot. So it it goes back to why is the report being asked for? Um, a lot of the reports that agencies look at sometimes are really about either certain data quality issues, or if they're looking for kind of broad client information that they can pull you know, without having to go into individual records. So one of the common reports that agencies want is you know, being able to pull a list of all of their enrolled clients, and then some either demographic information or other you know, income, whether or not they have um, you know, Medicaid or Medicare, whether they have you know, the county blue card, whether they have um, specific non-cash benefits to, you know, whether it's to track it from enrollment to exit or just to see, you know, who in their in their project doesn't have something like you know, SSI or SSDI. So that's a that's kind of a common one. And so with that, they tend to get, you know, really what is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet that will let them save, you know, all of their client information and they can, you know, go through individual records and look at it that way. Um, otherwise, they tend to be connected to like when they're looking for grant applications, um, or if they're looking to, you know, find gaps in their own services, and those can vary a lot based on what they're looking for. So, um, in the past, we've received requests about, you know, looking at, you know, that, you know, someone's looking to apply for a grant that is specifically targeting, you know, clients age 65 and older, or you know, families with you know children under a certain age in their household. And so in situations like that, it's not necessarily just coming from your own information. It could be system wide. And so, you know, if you're trying to apply for a grant that's saying, you know, looking to target a specific household type or you know, subpopulation, you know, people with a, a certain uh, you know type of you know mental health condition or something, we can help pull some information that is more more systemic. So you can look at, you know, this is what our need is locally. So it really varies by request. Um, and then, I mean, if for the HMIS monitoring we had to do um, across the system since October, uh, we're over, we're probably over 80, 80 customer report requests since October 1st. Um, so that includes everything from the COC board down to some internal requests, but we do get a fair number when HMIS took over or when HLA took over HMIS, it was a couple of months and now it's definitely increased to where it's a lot of what I do on a daily basis. So if you are interested in something, you can always reach out to us without submitting the, re the report request form. If you have some ideas about things you might want to see and we can, we can communicate that way. And then once we have it, you know, determined what you would want, then we can do the report request form and have that kind of like finalized. So if you have questions or thoughts or ideas about what you might want to see that will help your your agency, feel free to reach out to us. You don't have to fill up the, the form at that point. And we can you know, discuss what data is available, what options, you know, what you're looking for, um, and kind of start a conversation that way.
So, Marsha, believe it or not, everybody spells Brian's name wrong. We call him the brain. Yes, we call him the brain. So it kind of fits, right? Um, anybody else have any questions that we can help you with? No. All right. Well, we don't want to keep you. Um, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate everything that you do. Um, please stay safe and take care, everyone. And if you have any questions, don't feel hesitant about reaching out to us because we're that's what we're here for. Um, anything we can do to assist. Bye, Thank you guys as well.